So we are um, pleased to welcome Paul Dion to, to this conference. I think this is your first time coming to uh, present. No, oh, to present, yes. Yes, you know, you know the team and all of that. And I you think you have a few people on this team that have worked for you or worked with you. So that's great. Um, so it's 33 tools to remake your career. Um, and here you see that um, Paul's been a recruiter. Um, he moved away from recruiting and into this new career, but he um, sounds like he's loving sort of speaking and sharing this knowledge and uh, sharing different ways to help inspire people to do what they love, right? And yes. uh, so with that, we will, looks like there, we will, I will turn it over to you and take it away. All right. Well, thank you. And, you know, I'm so excited to be speaking uh, today. And some of you, of course, will remember me from my days in Los Angeles and my transition from recruiting into quality management software. Um, and some of you, of course, know that I wrote the book, 33, 33 Tools to Remake Your Career. And so we're here today to speak specifically about operating in a risky economy. So, I'd really like you to um, visualize for, for just one moment that um, you're, you know, where you are five years from now and you're, you're paid well and you're a high performer and you're in an exciting cutting edge job that, that doesn't even exist today, right? Um, and, and doesn't that feel exciting? I mean, in fact, it may be so exciting that you don't even see yourself retiring because you love what you do so much, <laughs> right? As the expression goes, if you love what you do, you won't work a day in your life. And so this presentation is about how to uncover new and exciting opportunities and energize your career while being prepared for any major shifts that happen in the economy. So I asked you to think about yourself in a job that doesn't even exist for a reason. Now, we all know that the pace of change is getting faster and faster. And in just the past decade and a half, sorry, decade and a half, we experienced the Great Recession and COVID, both of which accelerated dramatic changes in politics, economics, society, technology, and law. And so why position yourself is because these jobs here, as examples, all replace other jobs and probably multiple positions. So a drone manager and an autonomous uh, transportation specialist will probably handle the work of multiple drivers. And a gene therapy counselor and a human technology integration specialist will probably replace multiple healthcare workers. And so even if you're a believer that the profession of quality will continue to grow, changes in technology mean that some parts of the profession will probably eliminate other parts of the profession. And when we think about change, we also have to think about the source. So in the previous slide, we looked at a couple of jobs that could replace other jobs. But you also need to stay on top of what's going on in your industry too. And think about how the end of the Cold War changed the defense industry in Los Angeles, or what the loss of steel did to Pittsburgh or what foreign competition did to Detroit, right? Typically, you'll make more money in your career moving up the ladder in the same job and in the same industry. But if a sudden shift happens in your industry or in your job, you wanna be ahead of that curve and make sure that you're one of the first ones to make that move. Otherwise, you may be just one of many, many people who will be forced to move into a different job and maybe even an entirely different industry. And chances are they're gonna take huge pay cuts in order to do so. Or even worse, some people might be forced into a retirement, an early retirement that they're not yet ready to afford. So if you take it from the position that your career will change, uh, then the question becomes, how can you become prepared? And so obviously the first one is paying attention. Right, in quality, we like to think of systems. And so this is a system for listening for things that will impact your financial well-being. Right now, we're on the cusp of some things, something weird in the economy. 
we're in this really weird time where technically we've had quarters of GDP growth that was shrinking, which is the definition of a recession. However, companies are continuing to hire, they're continuing to expand. And so in a weird way, we're in a boom. And the stock market doesn't reflect at all what's going on in the economy. So most people think that somehow this is all gonna unwind, but nobody knows how. My insights aren't any better than anybody else's, um, but you definitely need to be reading the news and asking yourself, if the stock market were to tank tomorrow um, and the economy go into a full-blown recession, what will happen with my company? And what's gonna happen to my position, right? So networking is one way to build that buffer. And the unlikely event that something bad happens at work, who would you reach out to first? These could be people who they may wind up having a job for you, or they may just have project work, right? So if you've not spoken them, to them in a while, you should reach out. And with so much news in the world, it's hard not to get overwhelmed or distracted. And so this, this simple site that I really love, and it's called Follow That Page. And using this, when there's a change in management in a company, or there's a change to a careers page, you get an email notification right away. So I use this site to track all sorts of pages that I'm interested in and that I wanna stay on top of. And of course, finding good sources of news and blogs is important. So one of the reasons that I subscribe to the paper edition of Quality Progress is because I know after a full day of working on the computer, I don't want any more screen time. Right, so take your time to find high quality sources and make them fit into your lifestyle. And be sure to weed out those sources that are no longer relevant for where you decide you wanna go. And of course, commit to uh, lifelong learning. And in case this isn't obvious, there's a tool for each one of these items in my book. <laughs> so it may be hard to, to hear, but to get the maximum benefits out of social security, you're gonna have to wait until you're 70. Um, I don't know if for a lot of people, if like they just got this nasty feeling in their gut and maybe they like puked up in their mouth a little bit. Um, but you know, the reality is that social security has gotten really good at marketing. They say you get quote, full retirement, unquote, in your mid sixties and extended benefits if you wait. But the reality is if you can earn more then how can smaller payments be considered full retirement, right? So my point here is that your career isn't a sprint, it's a marathon, right? Take your time to figure out how to make that journey enjoyable, right? When I earned my undergraduate degree at 21, you know, how much of what I learned as an undergraduate is going to be relevant 49 years later when I'm ready to retire? And what if I told you that the degree I earned was actually in international relations right before the Soviet Union collapsed? Right, so degrees now are prohibitively expensive and they're having shorter and shorter half-lives, which is that half the information that you learn uh, will no longer be good in, in a few years. The fact that you're here today is a good indication that you're probably already a lifelong learner, uh, but you can commit to it right to the end without draining your bank. And one of the greatest things about ASQ, of course, is the professional certifications and the bodies of knowledge that they uh, represent, right? These six certifications, they're not expensive, nor do they take as much time as a, or money as a degree to earn, right? And ADSQ is just one of many professional organizations out there offering certifications. So as an example, even though I am a supplier quality, um, even though I have a supplier, a supplier quality professional certification, uh, today, unfortunately, I've, I spent most of the day studying for the supply chain inventory management cert certification, and I'm sitting for the first exam on Wednesday. But I want to caution you because I, I know that some people rush out to earn a whole bunch of certifications. It's, it's not just about earning that certification. It's also about applying, applying what you learned. It doesn't do you much good to get a hammer when you're working with screws, right? Applying what you've learned is much, much harder than people give credit for. And, but you need to think of it as your own continuous improvement process. 
Now remember in our visualization exercise, it wasn't just that you were in a job that doesn't yet exist and you're a high performer, it's that you're getting paid well too. And you're in luck because you're getting access to what I call the bonus tool, right? On the face of it, it may seem really obvious, but rarely do people take the time to rank lists and there can be big consequences. So if you're faced with a lot of potential choices, the easiest way is to list them out and to start ranking them. I don't know what the careers of the future will really pay, uh, but you can find out as they come up by asking your associates, HR, looking online. And of course you wanna rank them against all the positions that, that are established. And this list has a lot of impressive salaries on it, but the difference between the bottom one and the top one is $76,000 per year, right? So think about how much easier life would be with an extra $76,000. So if you have a solid list of, profession, of positions that you can work towards, positions for which you will be a knowledgeable expert, why not pick the one that pays the most? Ranking isn't just about pay, but it's also about choosing among different potential employers. Keeping a list of companies that you may wanna work for, including your current employer, also helps you to know who to reach out to for networking opportunities. So this is the way that I looked at companies on my list when I was job hunting. The first is a ratio of the amount of cash that they had on hand by the number of employees that they had. So in other words, bigger companies and smaller companies were more or less falling into the same ranking. And using this metric, of course, companies that have more money for projects and are growing will just naturally rise to the top of this list. It's my secret sauce. I deliberately didn't publish this in the book. So if you want to screen capture it, you know, please do. And if you think about it, a company that has a more money per employee is more likely to have generous benefits, more money for new projects, they're willing to spend money on fixing their problems, and they're least likely to have any layoffs. So I cannot emphasize how much having a list like this can transform your career. It's not just whether to track companies that have cash, but you'll have bandwidth to track other things, like do any ethical issues come up? Uh, how happy are their employees? Now, I realize that building a list like this takes a tremendous amount of effort, but if you can decide for yourself, um, I mean, this is a much better way than simply going out and applying to jobs because they're, they happen to be open at the moment. So the next step, of course, is to plan. And, um, you know, tool 16 in my book is to write next year's resume. And it's a whopping three pages long. And just like every other tool in the book, like you can jump right to the tool and use it. And so many of these things, they, they sound like common sense, but nobody really does them. And so these are the sorts of things that are gonna help you to command a higher salary in doing work that you love to do. So my biggest fear is that you'll see this as a book to read cover to cover when the reality is it's a collection of a bunch of ideas that you can, you know, each with like maybe five pages and you can start anywhere and you can skip to the tool that you're ready for. So I've organized this slide by the, uh, the theme of Daniel Pink's book called Drive. And it's basically how to, you know, find motivation at work. And he uses three elements, mastery, contribution, and autonomy. Mastery is about becoming that, that professional who understands, uh, who's a knowledge expert. Contribution is feeling like you're in a place where you're making a difference. And autonomy is about having that leeway from your management team to make decisions that are relevant to your job. And so when you're writing next, next year's resume, you can put these sorts of things into your resume in order, by identifying projects where you'll be able to do these sort of things. Uh, you may also identify certifications that you want to become uh, more of a, an expert at. 
And so, you know, believe it or not, I know a lot of this sounds like you, when you're ready to make a change, but the reality is that all of this stuff actually benefits your current employer too. So some companies you research and some of the people you network with will be competitors, but you'll be bringing important external perspectives and external knowledge into your company. I always joke that by definition, like half of the companies are worse than average, which means that some of the people that you network with may possibly come and work for your company. You may also learn that your company is in a better shape than you thought it was. And because you're ranking your employer alongside your competition, you can provide insights about uh, creating a positive ethical culture that are gonna help attract talent. And so if you take the time to write next year's resume, you'll most definitely identify things to apply at work in projects where you can make a huge impact. But today is really about how to position yourself in the event you must leave your current company. Ironically, it's an excellent exercise to sort of re-energize yourself in your current position. And that in itself may delay or prevent like your departure from ever even happening. So to wrap it up, Again, visualize yourself five years from now. You're paid well, you're a high performer, and you're in an exciting cutting edge job that doesn't exist yet. So what's your journey to get there? You know, you'll start by setting up a system to keep your pulse on what's happening around you. Commit to lifelong learning and continually improving yourself. And finally, adjusting each year by planning what you're gonna do next year. And when you do what you're meant to do, at a good employer, your work is gonna feel easy, it's gonna feel exciting, and you're gonna get paid well to do it. That's it. <laughs> That's great, let's see here. All right, I see some questions actually. Perfect. All right, oh, just one. Okay, so what methods are people using today to network when there's still some hesitancy to meet in person? Um, you know, I cannot say enough about LinkedIn. Um, and it, it may seem a bit trite, but the reality is that people are always um, thinking about the kind of talent that they need and the kind of uh, talent that um, they, they may not be ready yet to ask for. Uh, so a great example is there was one company on my list and, um, and this, this is a trick of recruiting back from the old day, right? Is you, you figure out when a company may, may need somebody and you reach out to that person in advance. So you may reach out to the CEO, for example, uh, and you know that something is gonna happen and you have the talent to help them out with that. So I reached out to a CEO who didn't yet have a sales engineering team. And, and, and I said, hey, when your company's ready, please reach out to me and let's have a conversation. And he did. And it, granted, it was, it was a long time. You know, it was kind of slow. It's not the kind of thing that you do, um, you know, and expect a result like tomorrow. But, um, you know, I wound up interviewing for a position that didn't even exist. So there's a lot of things out there that you can do online, like LinkedIn. Um, so that would be the number one. And I would say even, you know, part of today and part of this conference and part of the Slack that that's being set up is to kind of keep some of the conversations going and, um, you know, using some, some, some different ways of being able to gather as communities, even online. I've, I've, I, I know I've found good positive things from that. Um, I see we have a question from Angie, any position around certifications versus an advanced degree? Yeah, I would say advanced degrees now are just, they're so expensive. Um, so the first thing, of course, is minimize your student debt if you're going to go for an advanced degree. Um, a lot of people don't realize how dangerous student debt is. If you think about it, like the typical loan for, for student debt is more than a car loan. It's more than a mortgage. Um, it's In some cases, it's more than, um, you know, credit cards if your credit is really super good. Um, and, and yet it's guaranteed by the federal government. And you cannot discharge student debt, even in bankruptcy. And not only that, what's even worse is that they can garnish social security 
in order to get payments for student debt. So it's really super dangerous if you go back to school and, and you're not literally 100% sure that you're going to earn more money out of this. So I would just say minimize that student debt. If you have the funds and you wanna go back to school because it's, it's what you want, then absolutely do it. The certifications, I mean, ASQ publishes the, uh, the, the salary survey and, and it shows that the people who do get certifications earn more. And, and I can tell you in my own personal career, right? Um, so I, I left recruiting and then I was a sales engineer for quality management software. And I had already had the certified quality improvement uh, uh, associate certification. And then I went on to get the, the quality auditor and the, quad, the supplier quality professional. And I gotta say, I mean, I applied those things and, um, you know, for example, the auditor one, I re reworked our audit management app. And those things help me get raises. So it's not just about getting the certification, but it's also about applying it, but they, they do make a difference and they're far more affordable. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add on that one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And I know somebody has their hand up. Uh, I also uh, wanted to uh, allow CG um, to help uh, facilitate any discussions as well as needed. I know Paul and everyone else seems to be doing a great job of uh, of keeping the conversation going. But uh, if if you have anything that as well, CG. Um, and then I also noticed, uh, David, you had your hand up. If you wanted to contribute to the conversation, please feel free to. We'll see if uh, you, oh, CG's there. Go ahead, CG. Bring CG up onto the stage. I think we have his, don't we have his bio and everything there that we told people we'd show this afternoon? <laughs> um, yeah, it's just a, just a photo of him when he was, when he was a young man. No, I'm just was, kidding. There you go. <laughs> he still is. <laughs> well, yeah. just a, a small comment. The first sentence that Paul had on his first slide about change and I can tell you my story, which can go for hours. I worked for 40, 43 years in my life. And I changed about eight to eight jobs in that. So whether I wanted to change or whether I didn't want to change, the change came to me. It pushed me out of one job into another job. Do the best job and still, for example, one company I worked for, I was doing my master's in business administration at that time. And the vice president came and told me, he sat in my office and he respects me and all that stuff. He said, CG, why don't you go for quality, quality courses? And I said, hi, no, I need to finish this first, what I started and then go into that. He wasn't happy with that because he wanted me to take quality courses. I missed that point totally. And the company was paying I think $5,200 a year at that time in 1990s towards these courses that they wanted us to take. And what happens? He finally gets tired of me and says, okay, I'm going to look for another guy and you look for another job. Whichever comes first will part in an amicable way. And they paid for uh, me to uh, go to a company in Pasadena for a uh, consulting about finding, finding a new job. They were happy with my job, but they just weren't happy that I did not have an ASQ certification. So in life, changes are always there and we should be ready for a change. We know what happened yesterday, but that's past. Water run down the river, right down the bridge. But what's coming tomorrow, we don't know. We can only plan for it. <clears throat> in a way that will be better than what was yesterday. And to tell you frankly, in my life, every change has been better. Every change has been better. I have to learn new things, new kind of organization. And when I finished my MBA, I knew that I have learned a lot through about three job changes in the seven years that I did my MBA. And I learned to be a manager, to be an engineer, to be a corporate manager, all in one. So, that's my story. So I, and, and I teach this class at uh, Come to Mingo Sales, which uh, if Milton is there, he'll watch for it. That I teach uh, organization, organization development and change. And that's why I teach my students. 
be ready for tomorrow. If you see the signs that your company is going to slack off or is going to lose some competition or something like that, then be ready, be on the lookout to find another opportunity. Nobody waits for anybody in this world. The company will say, you stand on, we'll do this and we'll do that for you. But things go south, they cannot do anything. They have to tell you, sorry, we can't keep you anymore. So we have to be prepared with this change and the next job, as Paul says, with our complete intent. And the best thing you said is certifications. Better than uh, degree, certifications are very, very important because they're in the precise domain that you're working on them. And to tell you frankly, C CQA, it is a broad audit certification, but gives you understanding of how you be in different parts of the audit. How can you be the supplier, the, the customer, and the you know, processor in all. So these certifications have a deep, deep value and meaning, which companies do recognize. So that's what I can say. But I would ask people if they have any questions. I've guided people in my life. They came to me, I got this choice. I'm working here. I've got a better choice here. What do I do? And I put them, okay, make a matrix, put the important things for you and give some grading from one to 10. And whatever comes out best, do that. And a couple of them have succeeded in doing that. So, and uh, I've been working in different, in, I work for different industries, aerospace, defense, nuclear, uh, commercial, and medical. And so I learned a lot of things. And today I'm in a position to talk to anybody who wants to talk about any of these things. Any questions so, anybody? I might talk a lot, so I'm going to stop here. So I, I'd like to throw out a question to the audience, which is, um, you know, I, I, there's a lot of things in the, the, the CQA and the CSQP that I studied, but I also studied them in the master's degree program that I went through. Uh, you know, things like statistics and charting, uh, operations, and, and, and even right down to, you know, good styles for asking questions. And I wonder, you know, are there other people on the call who experience a similar thing? <laughs> I don't think they have that, that kind of uh, situation right now. Maybe they're pretty young in their job and doing it and happy with where they are, but they have to prepare for the future. Wherever, however solid you are in the job, be prepared for the future. I've seen people come to job and they call it the HR office and say, okay, thank you, but we have eliminated your position. Here's your package. So we should always be on the lookout for bettering ourselves that, uh, and, and be ready for the change. So somebody posted a, a good question. Do you find that those that write next year's resume, oops, sorry, hold on. Do you find those that write next year's resume sometimes come up with a job that doesn't yet exist? And do they then sometimes become entrepreneurs and create their own department within the current organization? That's an interesting one. I, I cannot point to a specific example that I've heard of, but um, I can say that, that sometimes it does lead to a change in responsibilities uh, within the position that the people are in uh, because they realize, oh, you know what, I don't, I'm not really good at this or I don't like doing this. You know, is there somebody else that we can give those uh, activities to? And then are there other activities that I can take off of my manager's plate, for example? So, um, I don't know about them necessarily, you know, leaving and coming, becoming entrepreneurs, uh, but there, there definitely can be changes in the position uh, based on that. And then there's another question here regarding certifications versus advanced degrees. My take is that even if you have an advanced degree, go for professional certifications in your chosen field. Uh, yes, I, I would say absolutely. You know, um, you know, those certifications, they, they, they demonstrate a certain level of expertise, especially within quality. And, and even though like I took classes, for example, in, in operations and in statistics, and I did all of that sort of stuff in my MBA, um, the reality is that in my conversations and in my interviews, what came up were the certifications that I had taken. Um, so yeah, they, they really are a very affordable alternative. 
If I may just chip in uh, to that question about the becoming entrepreneur within organization. Um, I was changing my jobs every three years, even I spent 10 years within a company, but I changed three jobs. And uh, reality, I was always creating my next job. So it's really kind of uh, what you have to do is to think how to create value for yourself and for organizations simultaneously. So if you, um, and I, I was kind of accidentally fine, nobody told me, but I was flying between academia and industry. I was doing work in industry, going to academia, learn, and then go back to industry or simultaneously applying that. And uh, as I say, kind of, uh, I was changing jobs every three years. And I was, for example, I was in Magna, which is automotive supplier, 10, $24 billion company. Uh, I was director for lean manufacturing for North America three years. And I was talking about Six Sigma that I did in GE before that. And uh, finally, I got money to kind of deploy globally, kind of uh, Six Sigma, South America, North America, and Europe. And uh, after three years, everything was steady. And uh, I got the assignment to build a plant from ground up. And uh, then a move kind of a, with the quality, you can move. I, I was in um, with SKF in Europe, then with PPG, then with General Electric, kind of uh, SKF bearing industry, PPG, glass industry and chemical, uh, General Electric, large motors, Magna, all automotive parts, then moving to Maple Leaf Foods, which is food industry, and then finishing in Life Labs, which is a healthcare industry. So with the quality, and uh, Lean Six Sigma, you can very quickly extract knowledge, but you have, when you select, my criteria for selecting a new job was um, if I will be able to really kind of uh, do things that I like, but as well, how much I'll be able to learn. And uh, really kind of what you're saying next year resume was not next year, it was learning for next year's resume. So you see kind of what, what are opportunity for learning and growth with your current job? And uh, then you have to dig and work hard. You have to create the regular kind of work uh, and uh, create new projects that, because very few people really within organization go to their manager and say kind of, oh, I see opportunity to save next $500,000. Do you want to hear more? Which manager will not jump on that? So it's really kind of, if you think how you can create value, uh, you will build your career. And uh, regarding ASQ certifications, uh, they're extremely powerful tool to get condensed structured knowledge. So it's really kind of, uh, I took for example, software engineering and biomedical because just to get structured knowledge in effective way, rather than going four years and learning 70% of things that I will not need or <laughs> not uh, need to do a job to get structured, take your ASQ certification. That's the best way to get jump in in the industry. When I move into healthcare, I took certified biomedical auditor. And, and uh, another beautiful thing with the, each certification, First one was CT, uh, CQE, it took me four months to prepare. And last one, it was taking two, three days because uh, <laughs> beautiful is kind of those things are just kind of principles and, and the knowledge repeat itself. If you look any kind of a Six Sigma or CQE or statistics is there, principles are there. So you're just adding that specific uh, industry specific knowledge. And that's really kind of, uh, I would encourage people to take at least three, four certificates, which fits your profile. Yeah, which uh, leads to another question that was asked in the chat, which is, uh, should you, should you, how many of the certifications that you earn should you list? And, and so my recommendation would be, you should, you should list them all on your resume, as long as that they're still valid. Um, and then the ones that are most important to the position for which you are applying, you should list in your summary. And that, that really sort of highlights that. Uh, so if you were going for an auditor position, then you know, obviously list that. Um, 
my current company does supply chain uh, management for the pharmaceutical industry. And so I had listed only the uh, supplier quality professional one in my summary when I applied to them. So uh, it's a second way of handling that is put, put the good ones that are relevant directly to that position right into the summary. And of course, we have to say congratulations to Mary for getting her Six Sigma black belt. I mean, what an accomplishment, like congratulations, like. Aw, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a little kind of thing to say here that you have to create a different resume for every job. Don't try to just make a standard resume and send it out because it defeats the purpose of pointing your, your abilities in the direction of the company's requirements. And that's what you have to tailor your resume, resume to that particular job that you're applying for. Yeah, you know, I mean, to me, the summary is like the most important part of, of the resume. And, and the reason is because if you write a good one, it, it very succinctly should describe exactly why you are a fit for that job. Right. And the, the first people who are going to look at that resume are probably going to be some screener. It's probably going to be somebody in HR, maybe, you know, a low level per person. And they may not know the ins and outs, but if your summary sort of speaks directly to the needs of that position and you've tailored it, uh, then the rest of the resume, like, like people spend like 11 seconds, like looking at resumes in those initial stages. So, you know, the rest of the resume will, will, will fall into place. That's very true. I heard some time back, this was about 15, 10, 15 years ago, that you need to put all the important words, the what to call, call them the bullet points that are on the requirement for the job in your <coughs> summary. And they put the resume through a computer and the computer selects those words and said accept or reject. So however good you may be, if those words are not there, the keywords, the resume is rejected. Mm -hmm. All right, Gurpreet asked the question, for somebody who started his career as a quality engineer in the financial sector two years back, what certifications would you suggest for the career growth? Um, so, you know, it's funny, like right now, my, my role is that I, I am in software sales, right? And there is a certification for that. Um, but the funny thing is, is that the ones that get the most attention from employers are the ones that um, are most relevant to my customers, right? So part of it is you have to think about what, what's really going to grab people's attention. Um, I mean, obviously, if you, you know, are a quality engineer in software, then, you know, hopefully you have the, uh, the certification from ASQ. Um, but if you want to, if you're happy in the financial sector, then I would say take a look at some of those certifications in the financial sector as well, um, because that's going to strengthen your ability to, um, to basically figure out what those outcomes, what that software should be doing. Um, I know, you know, for one thing, like you can, you test software, the dirty secret about software and validation, right, is you test to the requirements. Doesn't mean the requirements are right. You know, so, you know, having having that industry knowledge within the financial sector may be a way that you can add additional value because you'll have a deeper understanding of what the, the software is uh, supposed to accomplish. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think I've seen that as well. Like I used to work in medical device and there are many quality certifications that they look for, but uh, I've had a lot of people say that they chose for the jobs I've had in particular, because I have experience doing like uh, developing designs or moving uh, devices through startup process, for instance, and may not be specifically like a certification relevant to it, but they want something that shows you have expertise in what you're going to be doing quality on, as opposed to just the quality as well. So definitely a mix of both, right? Like they want to know you have the quality certifications, but having some certifications relevant to your subject matter seems to be pretty important too. And so for those who don't know, I, I, you know, I'm actually going to call out Rosemary Christopher because she's on the call. You know, I worked with her uh, when I was in California. Um, she's the one, she's the reason that I got the Certified Quality Improvement uh, Associate. Uh, you know, it's part of the apprenticeship program that she offers as well. 
Um, and, and so, you know, I, she loves being a recruiter, by the way, <laughs> you know, for me, uh, I didn't love it quite as much as she does, but you know, she absolutely loves it. And so, yeah, I want to call her out and, and of course, thank her for, you know, the opportunity to work for her, the opportunity to grow underneath her and to learn more about this profession, because, you know, it definitely led to some wonderful things for me. Thank you for doing the presentation. Thank you for being there for us. And um, I'm very, uh, I know you mentioned the book probably before I was able to dial in. Um, I just want to know um, if that book is um, viable to buy in bulk uh, for yeah. every apprentice that finishes the program. And we have 30 enrolling right, 30 to 34 enrolling right now in a career pathway. It will be a wonderful graduation gift. And do you know where I can get it in bulk? It Absolutely. I, I will get that to you and, and make that happen. Yeah, it's a wonderful, a wonderful presentation. Great gift. And thank you for the acknowledgement. It just, I made a special effort to be here today just to hear you. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm bursting with joy. Ah, thank you. <laughs> and, and as you know, it's a little rare right at the moment for me. So thank you so, so much. Uh, that's great. Thank you. Um, I think we had a, another follow-up question. Um, are you noticing, uh, and thank, thank you as well, Rosemary, always great working with you. Um, are you finding that uh, cover letters are becoming outdated if you uh, tailor the resume directly to the job? Yeah, cover letters are really a challenge because some, some people still ask for them. And the real drawback here is that you'll have a lot of people who spend a lot of time on cover letters that will never get read. And that's a little bit crushing. So what I recommend is, is that if you have a, a summary that does speak directly to why you are a viable candidate for the job, just use your summary and the cover letter and, and just you know tweak it a little bit, obviously saying, you know, I'm interested in this position, you know, here's my summary, and then and then um, you know, thank you. I hope you'll get back in touch with me. Um, I realize that people sometimes look for a writing sample, which is fine, but I think that people should ask specifically for a writing sample once, you know, you are in the, you know, some sort of an interview process or once you're actually being considered and not expect people to just, um, you know, spend their, their hours of time uh, toiling away at something that's not going to get read. Yeah. Uh, I know too, um, something that uh, I haven't seen mentioned here, but I've seen more and more common as uh, I've moved through a few jobs recently. Um, having a, like a website is something that you start to see people putting on, uh, putting on job applications to submit, especially as we start to have these more like data focused and even potentially programming involved positions. Um, and Honestly, it's uh, fairly easy to put together a very simple website for free on like GitHub pages, for instance. Um, I know I'm a millennial, right? And so when I was in grade school, we were taught how to do basic HTML. I grew up with this old thing called MySpace, where you used to have to code in HTML to make your page. It was like the predecessor to Facebook. Um, so, so I know it's a skill that some generations may have. Uh, since we were taught it, I, I don't know if it's still taught today, um, but being able to put together some sort of uh, uh, long lasting resume addition, like a website to show off projects and skills and just kind of show some competence in uh, in this data and, and programming focused environment, I think is a, is a neat skill to have. And I know it sounds intimidating, but uh, it's just like all of our speakers today have said, it's, it's really not. It's uh, no different than learning how to make a graph in Excel. You can certainly figure it out with a little bit of effort. Speaking of which, I haven't updated my personal website in years. <laughs> yeah, but you have one, right? So somewhere, yeah, I'll need to go check and see what's on there. <laughs> you know, you're in supply quality and recruiting. You know, none of that says I'm a computer scientist, and yet you, you're able to put together a personal website. So really, there's, you know, everybody can do it. It just takes a, a little bit of effort. Right. Well, speaking of, you know, I, I I sort of joke, right? But you know, I mean, jobs that don't don't exist. I mean. My my company that I work for, TraceLink, you know, we we just launched this past month a new product on predicting drug shortages 90 days in advance. 
you know, so it's like a really good example. Like here's something that is, is didn't exist, like not even a year ago when I started with this company. So, you know, it, it's, it's amazing the changes and the speed at which these changes are coming uh, and the, the need to be flexible and adaptable. I'll follow on that uh, question. Uh, you answered a little bit of my Paul, uh, question, Paul. Um, I want to thank you first uh, for being a part of the Los Angeles section. Um, we noticed you were missing, but didn't know why because I, I hadn't looked at uh, hadn't looked at your yeah. LinkedIn. Um, but uh, now we know why you're missing. Yeah, um, I'm in Boston now. <laughs> yeah, a little further away, but uh, we're yeah. glad you got you on here. Um, one of the things, uh, what I was going to ask about was the um, uh, intellect um, software mm -hmm. that uh, you were working with. Are, are some of your um, colleagues still working over there? Is that still um, something that uh, that uh, you like? Obviously, Tracelink is not a direct competitor, I don't think. No, it's not. Um, they're very different companies. Uh, Tracelink is a much larger company. There's about 850 employees. Uh, it's specifically for biotech, pharma, uh, and medical device companies. Well, actually, just biotech, pharma, really. Um, and that was one of the things that really appealed to me. Intellect is a, you know, they have a, they have a great business process management platform. Uh, they've launched a lot of new apps. They've branched out into environmental health and safety. Uh, I think they have uh, 20 apps that are in quality. Um, so, it, I mean, it's a wonderful company too. I, I highly recommend them. Um, you know, it's just you, you, you grow and you change and you need to, to make a change. And the person who took my position was, a, was a, a customer and she has 14 years of experience in quality. And so she was able to, to take over uh, my position really quickly. I actually found her um, and, and she started uh, like the week, the, the week before I left. So it was a, it was a great transition that happened there. That's and that's why you always want to leave a job. <laughs> always leave on good terms. <laughs> yeah, that's called like burning the bridges. If you, you want yeah, better. Don't never burn bridges. <laughs> it's too small of a world. And you'll be surprised. You go to another company and you find somebody you worked with before. He came from yes. another company and you just joined together. It has happened. Yes. Well, and not only that, but, you know, I mean, good people refer you. Um, I had a former coworker who called me up about a potential position. Um, I actually uh, just stole somebody out of intellect. Uh, he's a, in Germany. He's our, our, the account exec. And, um, you know, I knew he would be a good fit for, for Tracelink as well. And so, um, ironically, uh, intellect had cut back their hours. They, they realized they didn't want to go into, into Europe just yet. So he landed a job right away. Um, so yeah, always always keep those good relationships. So just a kind of a passing, but just not a question for this group, but just my comment. What will happen to all the fifty percent of Twitter employees who will be laid off? Um, you know, we know that Elon Musk is going to lay off fifty percent of the force. Do you think I, I assume they will take the money they've earned in San Jose and live a full retirement in Idaho <laughs> or something. <laughs> Hopefully they're already working remotely. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what happens uh, to real estate there, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. It'll be very interesting. As somebody living in San Diego, I've noticed that uh, I got very lucky that I, I got a house here before it went crazy when it seemed everyone in San Jose got a house uh, to move out of San Jose and move to San Diego. <laughs> um, well, yeah, um, people are welcome to reach out to me, uh, you know, and uh, I will put my, my email in chat. And, um, you know, so that people can reach me directly and yeah. And just let me know if you need any help. Yes. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time, Paul. And this is an amazing conversation. Yeah, it's great. Um, it's any other last comments you or CG want to make on the topic? 
Well, I would say this is a very relevant topic. It applies to everybody. I don't care. It may be director of the company, or it could be a peon in the company. It applies to everybody. Change is the only constant. Sometimes change takes you higher. Sometimes you've got to retreat and then go forward. But this is a constant burning question for everybody who is, like say, J-O-B, just over broke, right? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Um, 